people of God, praise the Lord. It's a great joy to be in a order, to be a river stage, and minister from your pulpit here to the rest of Nigeria, to the rest of Africa, and to the rest of the world. We're talking about anointing. And I pray that anointing that breaks every yoke will come upon your life. Father, we celebrate, and we exalt, we honor you. We know you are the reason for us being on earth and Christ, a Savior, a Lord who led everything and came to this world is the reason for us to be in the kingdom. The Holy Spirit has also anointed us that we will go forth that the story of Calvary that we all know, that we have experienced, will go and tell the rest of the world. We're asking, Lord, you take every vessel here and you use several one for your glory. Amen. Give us all we need so that we'll do all you want us to do. Amen. Thank you, Lord, for the answer. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. God bless you. You can sit down. We started in the first message with the anointing. Now, we're still talking about the anointing. We're going to use the story and the life of Elisha in particular. You know, God called Elisha. And he called him through Elijah. And Elijah carried the anointing. And now when he was about to be taken up, not seeing death, he asked Elisha, what do you want that I do for you before I leave, before I go? And Elisha replied, I believe we know the story, let a double portion of your anointing come upon me. Elijah said, you've asked a hard thing, a difficult thing. How can a man give you double of what he has? Once he even exhausts everything, that's all. But now, Elisha was asking for the double portion. The thing about Elisha is he had expectation. Expectation. There are people that go through life and they go through ministry. There's no expectation. They are where they are. They remain where they have been, and they do what they have always done. Those people will stay at that level. But the one that says, I've been there, I'm here now, and I want to go yonder, higher. Those are the people that have expectation now. Before Elijah asked the question, Elisha had expectation, but now he was looking for experience. You might expect something, but if you don't do all there is to be done, all God expects you do so that the expectation will come to reality, to realization. You wouldn't have the experience. That's why this morning we're looking at Exp expecting and experiencing the anointing that transforms. Anointing that transforms you as a preacher, as a person, as a priest, as an individual here on earth. You have an anointing that transforms you personally. Then the anointing that transforms your profession, your ministry, your church and the things you do, the activities you get yourself involved with, and then the anointing that goes beyond, that goes beyond the limitation of your present ministry and looks further, and you have an outpouring, an extension of what you have been expecting 
and experiencing the anointing that transforms. As we look at that, we're looking at three things. Number one, we're looking at the clear demonstration, imperishable mandate with anointing to toil and to travel for the Lord, for, for the ministry. You want to have the mandate, you know, the mandate already that Christ has given to the church. And you want to be able to address that mandate, approach that mandate, focus on that mandate that you will fulfill what he has called you to do by toiling and by traveling. Number two is the consecrated, importunate minister. You look at Elisha, that man was importunate. That man was consecrated and concentrated. A man of one goal, a man of one path, a man of one toil, a man of one ambition. This one thing I do. And he did it effectively. You have the mandate. Now you must have also the concentration as a minister so that you will achieve what God wants to achieve. He knew, that's Elisha, that the nation in which he lived, in which he ministered, was sick. And he wanted to be able to minister to his sick nation and bring that nation to the right side of the Lord. Number three is consumed, impacted messenger. A messenger of the Lord, a messenger of the people, and he was consumed with this one passion, and he was like burning for the Lord, and until the end, even after the end, after he was buried, if you know his story, he had died, and he was buried, and uh, they were taking a dead man away, and they saw a band following after them, so they dropped that dead man. And by the time the dead man touched and hit the bones of dead Elisha, he got up. I'll <laughs> give a better amen than that. <laughs> so when he was alive, he carried the anointing. And he carried the anointing to the grave to show it wasn't, it wasn't what he did, it was what he had. And I pray the Lord will so anoint you. Yes. That the mandate he has given you, the ministry he has given you, you will accomplish and you will have in Jesus' name. Number three then is the consumed, impacted messenger anointed to transform many nations. You could transform a locality. You could transform a community. But when you get to the point, you are able to transform a nation, many nations, something great is happening. And that great thing will be fulfilled in your life in Jesus' name. Amen. And we're taking it one by one. I come to point number one. In point number one, we're having the clear, imperishable mandate with anointing to toil, to travel over the nation. Elijah had actually started this ministry on the nation before Elisha came in. You remember? Israel as a nation, the people of God, the peculiar people of God, they are followed after Baal, Baal worship. And that's because of the marriage of Ahab, the marriage of the king. Actually, marriage matters a lot. If you are called to fulfill the will of God, to do the will of God, if you are not married yet, when you are going to marry, yes, so pray. But you also consider the person you are going to marry, will she accept the vision God has given you? 
the mandate God has given you, the commission God has given you. Or do you want to just get married for your flesh, for yourself? I want children. I want somebody that will be able to give back to many, many children. I want your ministry. You want somebody that will accept your vision, align with your mission, support you and be with you so that your ministry will be carried out as God has ordained. And for those of us who have married already, you need to find out the thing that goes on between you and your spouse. Is your spouse helping you, leading you to go in the direction of the mandate the Lord has given you? Or she is always toning down, always suppressing it, always supposing it, always saying, are we going to spend life like this? What's all this about? And if that is the case, you have to go on your knees and have the anointing in your home first. The anointing that will break every yoke. Amen. That will destroy the works of the devil. That you will be able to know. Thank God, a change can happen to Saul, and it becomes it becomes Paul. And a change can happen to you, and you'll be the man you ought to be. And a change can happen to your wife, and she will be all she needs to be in Jesus' name. And if your wife is not here, why don't you bring her tomorrow so that this same anointing on the man will be on the wife. And if you are here as a woman, as a wife, and your husband is not here, why don't you bring uh, him? Oh, uh, pastor, my husband is not a pastor. Well, is he not a professional? If he is a professional, my husband is not this, it's not that. Don't worry about that. Bring him to the presence of God, and something unimaginable will happen to him. <laughs> and so, we settle the home, we settle the family, and then with that understanding and with what God has done, we can now go ahead, you will fulfill your ministry. <laughs> Number one, we're looking at the clear, imperishable mandate with anointing to toil and to travel over the nation. Now, Elijah came to the nation in 1 Corinthians chapter 18. And in verse 21, he was now going to challenge the nation. If you are going to bring a nation back to God, you have to have the word. You have to have the calling. You have to have the courage. And you have to have the heart that will challenge the nation and challenge the leadership of the nation as God sends you. And so Elijah had told Ahab. And he said, gather all the people together. And as you gather them together, call all your prophets of bear. And then I will show. I pray at your own time. When your opportunity comes, you will show. Yeah. And they all came. And now Elijah was going to challenge them. And Elijah came unto all the people and said, how long will you hold between two opinions? That's the problem of people. Do we go right? Do we go left? Do we go up? Do we go down? Do we worship the only God, the supreme God? Or do we add some other minor, minor, ineffective, useless gods with him? How long will you stand between two opinions that you are holding here or there? It said unto them, If the Lord be God, follow him. But if Baal, then follow him. And the people could not say anything. The people answered him, not a word. And when you come out like that, and the Lord gives the word, and gives you the question, and you ask the question, if they didn't answer, now Elijah had the next thing to say. Because all he wanted to do was not to hurt anybody. All he wanted to do was not to hurt or to condemn Ahab. All he wanted to do was not, uh, you know, to crush uh, Jezebel. All he wanted to do is for the people to realize that halting between two opinions will not lead them anywhere. That they will realize that the God of heaven is the God of Abraham, of Isaac, and of Jacob. And he is the one that 
we serve as individuals, as families, as communities, and as a whole nation. And when they didn't answer, I said, all right, well, give it a test. These uh, Baal worshippers, they say, is the God of fire. All right, let's have, not theory now, let's have the practical. And he said, let all the prophets of Baal come, you know the story, and let them worship and pray and ask their God, if he brings fire, we'll all follow him. But if he doesn't, I, I am standing all alone. Thank God, one prophet with the anointing is greater than 450 prophets of Baal. They are shouting, they did rig my role, and they boxed the air, they even caught themselves. Uh, they, they, they did some show of fanaticism, but no fire came. And so, in the midday, Elisha said, ah, what's happening to you? Shout more. If that God is asleep this day of contest, he must wake up. And so they shouted more, and they caught themselves. And there are people that think that if you jump when you're preaching, that's anointing. If you run there, run there, that's anointing. If you grab a man there, you throw him, on, you receive, they say, that man has anointing. If he leaves the pulpit, and he goes to somebody in front there, lays on him, and shakes him like this, so that that fellow feels dizzy and falls to the ground. My, my, look at anointing. That is not anointing. That just playing the game. Elijah did not do anything like that. Elijah was watching them. And then at the time of the evening sacrifice, he said, okay, since your God cannot bring the fire down, uh, let me repair the altar. If you are going to bring revival, to any group of people, you must repair the altar. All the things that have gone here and there, and they are all scattered. This one is preaching his own. That one is preaching his own. That one is saying that Paul, you know, does not, uh, did not have the truth of God. The other one is saying even Jesus did not have everything. Uh, some other people are saying now we come for, there's a new revelation that they have discovered that they can have a word higher than the Bible. You have to repair the altar. All this, uh, Errors that people are perpetrating. You have to come out of that and say, let's see what the word of God says. He repaired the altar and then he dug a trench around that altar. He said, pour water there. They poured uh, bar barrels of water, pour again and pour again the third time, four times and three uh, times uh, three, twelve to represent the nation of Israel in all their tribes. Everything you do, you must ask yourself, is this according to the word of God? Is this what the Lord has laid down for us to do? Never mind what other people are doing, Tele evangelists are doing whatever they want, and you know, other people from abroad and from here and from everywhere, they're doing this so that don't just take it because so and so is doing it, such and such is doing it. Is it according to the word? And then uh, he slew the sacrifice, laid on the altar. And then at the time that he knew that God had told the children of Israel, this is the time to call upon me, he called upon the Lord. He didn't have to shout. How much will you shout on earth for your voice to reach my millions of miles to get to the sky. It's not the shouting, the anointing. It's not the running, kneeling upon the altar, arranging the wood after, after everything is said. Now, it's your faith that now comes because, Lord, send the fire down and let the people know that I've done all this according to your word. And the fire fell. Yeah. It will come to your turn. Yeah. And the fire will fall. And eventually the people said, The Lord, He is God. The Lord, He is God. But Elijah was about to go. That's why God told him, You will anoint Elisha in your room. That he is in your stead. That he is in your place. 
And when you are gone, he will be the next one to follow. And it's not only Elisha. Think about Jeremiah. God told Jeremiah, when Jeremiah said, no, I cannot do that, Lord. And the Lord said, don't say, I am a child. Because I had already sanctified you, set you apart, separated you for this ministry, even before you were born. Uh, we're not, uh, you know, forced to be born again, so you cannot say, okay, if God wants me to be saved, I'll be saved. He must have no need before I was born. Yes, he knows. He knows that you are going to be saved, that you are going to repent. You still have your responsibility before you get saved, but for the ministry, for the work. He said, I've separated you. And don't say you cannot do it. Check your language. Look at your life. Look at your normal conversation. What do you always say when you are confronted with something intimidating that you feel is beyond me? This is above me. Can I do this? Can I go that way? Check your language. And God said, I've chosen you. What had he chosen him for? We're told in Jeremiah chapter 1, we're reading from verse 8. Jeremiah chapter 1, reading from verse 8, it says, Be not afraid. What makes us to run away from ministry? Fear. What makes us not to do what we are called to do? Fear. What makes us to run from the battlefield, from the evangelistic endeavor? Fear. What makes us not to confront the things and the issues in our families, in our community, in our nation that God wants us to confront. What makes us not to confront them? Fear. And fear will damage, will ruin, will bury both the dreamer and the dreamer. But God said, Jeremiah, be not afraid of their faces, for I am with thee. The Lord will be with you. Amen. And once he says, I was thee, that means the Almighty God, the Father, talking to him is within. Isn't that anointing? The Holy Spirit on us, anointing, and Christ in us, living big. And living the way he ought to live, if he were here on earth, lives inside us in that anointing. Jeremiah had anointing. You accept? Because God the Father said, I am with you. How could a man be not anointed if God is with him? And he said, to deliver you everywhere you go, says the Lord. Then the Lord put forth his hand and touched my mouth. And the Lord said unto me, unto Jeremiah, Behold, I have put my words in thy mouth. The Lord will put his word in your mouth. Yeah. And when you have the word of God like that, a man was such the almighty God talking to him. Any other voice that speaks after that is nonsense. Nonsense is no sense. What the almighty God has said, that makes sense. I said that makes sense. Whatever Satan says after God has spoken, what's that? A man runs to you. I cannot tell you how many times. Some people here in Nigeria, and how many years, somebody, you know, will come to me, and early in the morning, and he will tell me, he has not drunk water, he has not done the chewing stick or whatever, that he had been fasting for three days. And the Lord told him to come and tell me that this preaching of holiness, that I should not continue like that. 
that if I continue like that, that I will not have members. And God sent him to me to tell me that. And God had spoken to me at the beginning that I'll preach this gospel, follow peace with all men, and holiness without which no man shall see the Lord. And I'd carried that, carried that. And I've gone here, gone there, everywhere, preaching that word. And the Lord confirmed the word. And this man said, He fasted three days. And God sent him to me to tell me not to do this. What's that? I told him, I said, No. God sent you to me so I can put you right. He didn't send you to me to come and tell me this. He sent you to me so I can put you right. He didn't agree at that time, but I said, listen, I told him, told him, told him this point, this point, and then he left. He came back to me, I think about one year later. He said, mentioned my name. He said, you are right. Yeah. No, it's not me. It's God. What God has said makes sense. What any other voice comes to say after that is nonsense. nonsense. The Lord has joined you together with your wife, with your husband, and he has said, what God has joined together, let no man put asunder. Now, a bishop, a preacher, a prophet comes to tell you that woman is, they'll describe what they want to describe, put her away. When God told you what God has joined together, let no man put her asunder, separate, divorce, which one, which one is says, which one is nonsense? What God has said, that is says, sensible. What this man, call him by any title, is a bishop greater than God? A priest greater than God? A tele-evangelist greater than God? Whatever they say, behind, beyond, Contrary to what God has said, that is nonsense. And so God told Jeremiah, be not afraid of them. They'll say whatever they want to say. They'll do whatever they want to do. But already you have heard the word. And I've put my finger, my word in your mouth. And then he says, I'll make you like a brazen wall. They'll fight against you, but they will not prevail against you. Give me a good amen. And by the grace of God, all these many years, I've gone to all the states in Nigeria. I've gone to almost all the countries in Africa. I've gone to Europe. I've gone to America. I've gone everywhere. And the word the Lord has given me, that's the word I preach everywhere. And as long as I stayed with the word, the anointing has remained. Yeah. The anointing in your life will remain. Yeah. And it doesn't take uh, shouting or, or maybe jumping and boxing the air. We well, were uh, on the radio in London many years ago now. And the... Uh, the person broadcasting, asking me questions, as about the ministry, as about the preaching, as about everything, I answered her. And she said, this healing, healing that you people talk about, that's the way she spoke, uh, what's the healing about? I said, well, I can't tell you theory, but if you have sickness on, on air, you know, people, why it was being transmitted live, I said, if you're sick, for example, and then I pray, you will tell me what they call healing. 
And so she said, you know, uh, Pastor Preacher, uh, I have this uh, problem and I've taken it here and there. well on air. And I said, I didn't close my eyes. I sat there in front of her and said, in the name of Jesus, let healing come upon her. I didn't touch her, but I, you know, was sitting across the table together. I said, oh, I'm healed. I said, that is healing. You know, when you carry the anointing, anywhere you go, everywhere you go, you will not be ashamed of what God has called you to do. You will do it effectively. We well, were in Canada, 100 Huntley Street. And, you know, I was giving a series on the gifts of the Spirit. And uh, so when we finished, when I finished the message of that day, uh, the, the man there who was, you know, moderating everything, uh, said, now you can ask your questions from anywhere. And from that state, they had the question. From that state, they had the question. And I answered. And I said, now, they have asked the question. I said, you know, somebody there, you are listening now. And she you have this problem. I described the problem and I prayed for that person. And I said, give us your answer. In a minute, she shrank back and said, I am healed. <laughs> that is the kind of anointing we're talking about. Not a make-believe, not something that you, you know, manipulate and all that. That will allow God to be God. And when you allow God to be God... It will do something in your life. Yeah. I'm coming now to point number two. Point number two, we're looking at the um, we're looking at the consecrated, importunate ministers, anointed uh, that that anointing will treat a sick nation. That anointing will treat a sick nation. As you look at uh, Second Kings, we're looking at Second Kings chapter 2, and I'm reading from verse 9. Second Kings chapter 2, we're looking at verse 9. It says, and it came to pass, that means it so happened. When they were gone over, they went over, River Jordan. They had been coming from Elijah said, Elijah, stay here. The Lord has sent me to Gilgal. And Elisha said, As the Lord liveth, and as your soul liveth, you are still living here with me. I will not leave you until you are gone. That's a man looking for something. Rain, sunshine. Difficulty, whatever I am following. You are like that. Yeah. I said you are like that. Yeah. You pray once, it has not happened. You keep on praying. Yeah. Those people are before me right now. Yeah. You keep on asking and you have not gotten it. Importunate, importunate. You keep on asking. Thank God you are here today. Today will be the solution, the answer for that long awaiting request in your life. And Elisha said, Stay here. The Lord has sent me to Bethel. <laughs> we're going together. You and I were going together. Yeah. And then the 50 prophets, sons of the prophets, they came. And he said, do you know that the Lord will take away your master from your head today? Those are people, the many in the land. They have revelation, they, have, they don't have realization. They have discernment, they don't have decision. They knew that Elijah was going that day. And all they were saying, do you know, do you know, do you know? They taught, but they didn't have the mind to follow. I would have the mind to follow. <laughs> if some people knew that the rapture 
was going to take place tonight, they still keep on doing what they're doing. The knowledge will not change their action. The knowledge will not change their habit. The knowledge will not change their concentrations, the things they concentrated on. And he got to another city, do you know? The Lord will take your master from your head today. Elisha said, I know. I'm not for discussion. I'm looking for something you are not looking for. And I want to get. You don't have the mind you will get. And finally, they crossed Jordan. And Elisha did not think for a moment. How are we going to, am I going to come back this man? I know he's living today. And uh, all these other 50 sons of the prophets, they told me he's living today. And I know. And how are we going to cross River Jordan? How will I come back? You don't think about anything. How, how you burn the bridge behind you. Because you will have something. That will build the bridge back and you will get where you're going in Jesus' name. And so they crossed River Jordan. And when they got to the other side, Elijah now knowing that this man wanted something and was going to get it. And I know you want something. You are going to get it. So... In verse 9, it came to pass when they were come over that Elijah said unto Elisha, Ask what I shall do for thee before I be taken away from thee. Elijah knew he was going. And yet in all his conversation with Elisha, there was no frivolity. There was no carelessness. There are, you know, preachers and overseers and superintendents. We see them on the pulpit. They're serious, dead serious. They're sober, really sober, but in their private lives with somebody they love like an, an Elisha. They'll be frivolous. They'll talk things that even Elisha will be wondering. Ah, so Papa talks like this. So Elijah talks like this, but not Elijah. When you become a really, even as a Christian, as a Christian, you know that your words must be meaningful. Your words must be weighty. Your words must always show the way. It's not only when you're on the pulpit. And so now, Elijah had never told Elisha that this Elisha was turned in his room. We were too quick in giving out some promises to some people that get near uh, to us. Maybe you are like Alexander the Great, I think. Um, you know, he was looking at his army. And he was about to tree because the, the horse was about to throw him down. And a, a sergeant just came out of the line and studied everything. And uh, so Alexander the Great says, thank you, captain. He wasn't captain, he was just a sergeant. And so much Alexander had mentioned it, thank you, captain. And he went back there and he said, I am now the captain. Who said so? He said so. Mind your word. Sometimes you are very much impressed by somebody. Sometimes you are taking in with somebody, but you don't know the details of his life, his, his private life. You don't know how dependable, you don't know how trustworthy, and you don't know what will become of this man, of this woman, because of his private life, her private life. But what for, you know, there are times we have little difficulty and little challenge, and God inspires somebody to help us, like God inspired the ass of Balaam. And open the eyes of the eyes, the eyes of Balaam, the eyes of the ass, and saw the angel. And so went this way, went that way. And um, so when Balaam now began to strike the ass, 
God opened the mouth of the ass and he spoke in tongues. Did you get me? Because asses don't speak the language of man or the language of Balaam. But the ass spoke in tongues. Good language. Perfect language. Grammatically correct language. And Balaam understood. And Balaam replied the ass when he said, I've been your ass all these many years. Have I done this? Why are you smiting me? And then Balaam replied, no, so Balaam could have said, look at this ass, I promote you to be my assistant pastor. Uh -uh. Don't be that careless. They may do a good work at the spot of the moment when some inspiration comes upon them. Close your mouth and watch. To see her pride, you see egotistic, you see position seeking, you see doing this for that. Don't talk, don't talk. They can do some good, good things that will impress you. Wait until God says, This is the time, this is the man, this is the woman, and then you can talk. Am I right? Yeah. And so at the right time, Elijah said, Ask what you want before I be taken away from you. And here is now what Elisha asked. And Elisha said, I pray thee, let a double portion of thy spirit be upon me. A double portion. Somebody shout, a double portion. We sing that in our churches, a double portion, a double portion. Oh, Lord, at the time of Ezekiel, at the time of Isaiah, at the time of Elijah. And then we follow through and we say, double portion, a double portion. But you know what? When God called Elisha, and Elijah had not told him what he would do. It was all he did. A manager, a director, a foreman, a, a professional person, a toiling and making gain, left everything. And all he was doing was pouring water on the hands of Elijah. And he didn't mind. He knew God had called him. He wasn't looking for an exalted position and a, a, you know, exalted a kind of popularity. Just pour, pouring water on his hand. But his time came. Your time will come. Yeah. I know for many years after I got born again, for many years after the Lord sanctified me, for many years after the Lord baptized me in the Holy Ghost, all I was doing was reading the Bible, studying the Bible. I was studying the Bible like a professor. I studied the Bible more than my mathematics that I was lecturing at the university. I studied and studied. I studied John Wesley. I studied Charles Finney. I studied um, Chair Osborne. I studied Modi. I studied as if I was going for an exam. And yet, I wasn't really doing anything that showed the level of the knowledge I had. And the Lord that showed me in Revelation what I will do. The crowds I see today at the GCK, the ministers conference, what I see today, the Lord showed me that when I was nothing, when I was nobody. But I just kept on studying. I didn't ask, when will this come to realization? Just Keep on doing the right thing you are, you are to do. Your time will come. Yeah. And by the grace of God, the time came. It has happened for Elisha. It has happened for me. Am I allowed to give testimony? Yeah. <laughs> because, you know, our converts, our people, they give testimony. So me too, I have testimony. Yeah. And the Lord has done it for me. Now, you will give your own testimony. And so the chariot came from above and lifted up Elijah. And Elijah did not lay hands on him. Notice that. Elijah did not take him by the shoulder, demonstrate power, fall under the power. No, no. 
He saw Elijah and he said, My father, my father, the chariots of Israel. And the mantle fell. The mantle fell. Please remember when Elijah met Elisha for the first time. He was toiling. Elijah took his mantle and put it on his shoulder. But he took it back. And Elisha understood. He said, I'm coming. Let me tell daddy and mommy that I'm gone. I'm gone with him. He said, what have I done to you? Go back again. And that mantle remained in the hand of Elijah. Now at this time, as the chariot took Elijah away, the mantle fell. He didn't have to ask, should I take the mantle? Elijah is gone, the mantle is here. You asked him for double portion, you asked him for the mantle, and he dropped that for you. And so he took it. You will take it. Yeah. And this is now mantle in my hand. What is the last thing Elijah did with this mantle? He opened Jordan. Okay. The last thing he did will be the first I will do. Yeah. And so he went back to River Jordan. And he rolled the mantle together. Remember, he had torn his own mantle in two. Disposed of his own mantle. He had disposed of the mantle of weakness. And now he took up the mantle of power. And he said, where is the Lord God of Elijah? And he smote that Jordan as Jordan obeyed his master. Jordan obeyed the servant. And the, and the river parted in two, and it went over. You will go over. Yeah. Through that Jordan that stands between you and ministry, you will go over. Yeah. Through that difficulty, the ocean of problems that stands between you and your next level, you will go over. The sons of the prophets recognize those same sons of the prophets that have said, do you know the Lord is taking your master away from your head today as they cross over? They were watching him. They will be watching you. You see the manifestation of anointing. You see the power. They will see the authority. They will see that Although we all have the name of Jesus, but you, you have a particular, peculiar authority through the name of Jesus. And so they came and they bowed down to him. They said, the power, the spirit of Elijah does rest upon Elisha. It's not just what you say, they will say it. It's not just what you proclaim. They will proclaim it as well in Jesus' name. Amen. And so now that the anointing has come, he didn't go back home resting on an armchair. He did something. Can I tell you here? You will do something. Amen. And when, I didn't say if, when our paths cross again, I will see you. Amen. You will have good heaven sent testimonies to give in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, as we talk about Elisha, we have followed him now to the point where the mantle fell. The power fell. The question is, number three now, what happened after the power fell? Point number three, consumed, impacted, messengers, anointed to transform many nations. 
anointed. Not anointed just to sit at home, to do something. You know, some people, um, you know, those who are bold enough to come to me, everybody should be bold to interact with me. I'm not, my personality is not intimidating. Most of you, if I told you to stand up, you are taller than I am. And so why, why are you going to be afraid of a man who is shorter than you are? And so we can interact easily. You can ask me questions. And we can ask Elisha question. And what happened with the anointing that came to you? The anointing that came on Elisha was to transform that nation. And the anointing that comes upon you is to transform you and to transform Many nations. Give me a good, good amen. amen. And so, as we look at his ministry, Elisha, having the anointing that equipped him to transform his nation, transform. I want to use the letters, the Letters of the word transform. So you write a, a, you write a T and R and A and N and S and F and O and R and M. You write vertically. I want to show you from the ministry of Elisha that actually the anointing so equipped him that he transformed the nation in which he lived. And as you look at all this, you want to also stand by the side of Elisha to see how do I transform my nation. As he came out, the people of Jericho, they told him, they said, this land is pleasant, but the water is not. When they drank the water, it made them feel sick and eventually many of them die. And when they planted anything, it will not grow. And so they said, the water is bad. It causes deadness. T for transform. Treat the source of water or salt. So Elisha said, bring me a cruise of salt. And he gave him. And he went to pour that cruise of salt at the source of the water, and the water was healed. Salt to the source of the water, that was the treatment that Elisha gave that water for the nation to drink. What's in that for us? Jesus said, the converts, the disciples, are the salt of the earth. And we don't keep that salt in the bottle because the salt of the earth, the believers, the Christians, those who are born again, and they have the life of God in them. And the sweetness of Calvary has come into their lives. They are now salt of the earth. We understand. Take it to the source of every village and every town. And the, and the salt will heal the waters in prophecy. Water represents the people. And as you, you know, multiply the quantity of the salt and we have there and there, and you plant them everywhere, the village will be healed. The cities will be healed, and our nation at large will be healed in Jesus' name. R for Elisha, raise the standard of servanthood and welfare. Raise the standard before Elisha, no engaged man, employed man, professional man, director, will follow after a prophet, a master, and just be pouring water on his hand. That was his humility. That was his acceptance of what God wanted him to do at that time. As we go anywhere, everywhere in our nation, raise the standard of service. 
the standard of servanthood in your place of work, in your schools where you teach, in your place where you are the proprietor, in the place where you are the leader, in the place where you are the director, in the place where you have authority, raise the standard of servanthood. That's what the Lord is calling us to by the grace of God. When I, when I was, you know, in a primary, as a teacher in the primary school, primary school, you know, I did that. And all those uh, children, primary five, primary six, teaching them, I did it with all my heart. And then I upgraded to secondary school. And I was teaching the end the mass. And when you go for the WIAC exam, most of them will get distinction. And and, uh, you know, a few of them who are not paying much attention will get credit. And I did it with all my heart. And then I went to university. I became a lecturer. What I did, I did with all my heart as if I was serving God. Yes, you are serving God in a place of profession. And you raise the standard of servitude. You don't say your principal is not here. Uh, my neighbor in a if like uh, in a place there, they say like a pharmaco, that you know, you're doing it and, and, and they don't see you. Whether they saw me or not, I raised the standard of uh, servitude. Other teachers, they may want to engage me. I said, look, I have classes now. I have to go and teach. I have, I have days to do now. And before I went to the class, I really prepared Prepared. And when I taught those young people, the university, university level, uh, I never had a student that to say the man actually is not uh, teaching us. He just uh, coming here and quoting Bible. When I'm in the math class, I don't, I'm not employed there to go and coach Bible. I'm employed there to go and teach math. And I did. You will do. Yeah. I said you will do. Yeah. You're a salesman. Do it well. You are a nurse, do it well. You are a doctor, do it well. You need to excel in what you do in the world. We raise the standard of servitude, of service in every place where we are. Now, we're talking about transform. You add supernatural supply to those who are suffering widows. If you look at the story of Elisha, a widow came and said, the creditors have come. They want to take my two sons. And Elisha said, what do you have at home? Elisha did not say, poor widow, don't take my time. Don't waste my time. I have dignitaries to preach to. I have authorities to deal with. I have those people up at no. He added solution, supernatural solution, to those people that were low, to those widows, and to the people that cannot pay back. That's what the anointing does in our lives. It treats our community or the salt that is for the believers, he also raises up the standard of servitude around him and he adds value. You add value to people. You know, to those who are down, add value, raise them up. To those who are poor, add value. Uh, you know, there are pictures and, you know, they take even the little that the widows have in our nation here. You see, if you sow this seed, the Lord will multiply it a hundredfold. Uh, let, let's be sincere. Let's be sincere. And if you're a preacher like that, you are here, let's, let's talk. Let's talk. Those widows have next to nothing. And then we preachers, we brainwash them. And we tell them, and those poor widows, what can they do? They just, they just believe every word we speak. And all they have, all the inheritance they have from their late husbands, they put at the apostles' feet. And after they've done that, God bless you, God bless you, everybody can say that, they go back home, examine, check up. All those people who have given everything as the prophets told them in our land, where are they today? How are they feeling? How are their children doing? 
How are they sending their children to school instead of the prophet that already has millions, a millionaire already, instead of him looking for the widows and say, your children who are not in school, can I, what do you want to do? What do you want to read? And, and then sponsor them just for God's glory. We don't have that. We only have the people that take from the widows and render them poorer. And they are getting richer and richer. The preachers of today, they're getting richer at the expense of the members of their church. Let somebody speak out. Let somebody tell our prophets, our preachers, our bishops, that this ought not to be. In the case of Elisha, in the transformation of the nation, he added supernatural supply to the suffering widow. And N is to neutralize the seniors, serious, serious uh, sickness with the word of power and faith. The seniors. Here comes Naaman, a senior man in the army of his master. He had leprosy. He said, he's a great man, but a leper. And went to the king in Israel. The king said, oh, what can I look at this other king? He's looking for a chance to fight with me. And Elisha, he turned. Elisha said, send him here. And when he got there, Elisha sent to him, go deep yourself in Jordan. How many times? How many times? Seven times. And your flesh will come back again. I would need to study these people that have the anointing. The people who have the anointing today, they'll see the captain of the army coming from Syria. They'll not see the poor, dying fellow near their church building. And if they finish the service and somebody runs to them, somebody wants to see you. Who is that? Well, we really don't know his name, but he looks like a poor man and a sickly man and a dying man. Tell him to come to church. If it is the captain of the army, Sir, somebody wants to see you. Who is he? See? Captain so and so. Oh, come on in. And then they'll give ours. Are we partial? Are we dancing to the tune of the world? Are we serving like Christ would have served? I think we need to speak to ourselves. If I change and you change, and the change for you and for me changes other people, we will change this nation. Yeah. And so, the man, Naaman, he got angry. You know, sometimes we preach, I know I preach, and some people get angry. They say, before I heard him, I, you know, I've heard of his name, Kumui, Kumui. Everybody say Kumui, Kumui. And, uh, you know, I love the man. But, you know, the first thing, uh, the first time I heard him, uh, I went to, you know, maybe a crusade or whatever, and the man began to preach. I was enjoying it until he opened his mouth and said, polygamy is not of God. I was shocked. I never had that from anybody. Polygamy is not of God. Get this woman, get this woman, get this woman, and divorce and all that. I, since that time, I don't like the man at all. Why don't you like the man? <laughs> what did I say wrong? Because you have, you're packing them up, woman after woman. And I told you, the first time you came, the first time you listened to me, that this is not of God. But you know, even though Naaman was angry, 
Elisha didn't come back to him to say, oh, I'm sorry, your excellency, your honor, your majesty, I'm sorry that I told, I sent to you like that. Never apologize for a message coming from God. Yeah. Anybody can get angry. Nebuchadnezzar can get angry. Herod can get angry. What God has said, God has said. And you can tell, you can tell by, you know, the actions of the people that listen to you. And, you know, the other time you preach it like this and they want to block your way. So that they don't say that thing again they don't want to hear. They don't want to hear that alcohol will destroy them on earth and destroy their destiny. They don't want to hear that that marijuana they are smoking will destroy them. And you happen to be the lonely voice that has said so. And so you now come and you say, before you say that, uh, you know, nauseating things thing again. Let's block him. Let's act this way and act this way so that we can shut him up. You'll never shut Elisha up. A man of God, that man of God does not have anointing. Anointing also endures persecution. Anointing makes you to stand on what is right. Whether the people like it or not, thank God I have a crowd this morning. You love the truth. Yeah. Am I right? Yeah. So I'll tell you all the truth I remember. The one I don't say now, when I come back again, maybe not this time, maybe another time. The ones you have not had, but I know that will take you to heaven, you will hear it again. Yeah. And so we have this, that he neutralized all that, uh, that Naaman was uh, you know, spewing out. I want you to do that, that whatever people say, however they act, you neutralize all those things that they do. S E smooth. Seek, uh, sorry, smite secretly the people that have come to oppose the will of God, and then you are able to uphold the truth. Smite. After Naaman came, and Naaman said, Now, there, I know there's no God anywhere but here in Israel. And he pleaded with him, take money, take, he said, no, I'm, I don't do this for money. Jesus said, freely, you have received, freely give. Jesus had not even come to say that, but Elisha already had the message of Christ in his life, in his heart. How many people are living today? Christ had said so. Healing is not for sale. Miracle is not for sale. Deliverance is not for sale. Progress, answer to prayer is not for sale. Freely you have received, freely give. After Jesus has established that, and he told all those traveling evangelists that went to those places, don't take money for your service. The people today, you know, sometimes... I'm not saying this to ridicule anybody. It's just to point out the truth. They say you are going to give offering. And the amount of offering you give will determine the height of miracle you receive. Show me that in the Bible. They say if you give a million, guess what kind of miracle you will have. If you give... 500,000 guess what kind of miracle you will have if you give a hundred uh, thousand guess what kind of miracle you will have and they will not go lower than a hundred thousand you have ten thousand keep that yourself 
50,000, give that to yourself. Now we're waiting. And there's no secrecy here. All the, you know, the bags are here. The boxes are there. So you stand up, drop your own, and make sure if you really want, really, really want great miracle, here is, here is your chance. And, and they spent how many minutes now? Long time collecting, collecting, collecting. And once they gather everything together, they don't allow you to go to the ushers to no count, no count. Just put them here at the back of my car. Now, if that's what we think anointing is for those who received the anointing before us they were not like that i will not be like that i said i will not be like that and the lord will prosper you i, I don't need to tell you we have this gck every month and as we have the GCK every month, a lot goes into the publicity over the radio, over the television, over the social media. A lot goes into, you know, renting places where uh, some of the people who come and are not able to go back to their cities where they stay. A lot of money goes into this, into that. And yet, at the crusade field, we don't want anybody to think I'm going to come to GCK and buy my healing. No, it's all of grace. Jesus paid for it all. And yet, as we do it every month, we are not the poorer. I said we are not the poorer. The Lord will prosper you. And the Lord will provide for you. Yeah. It says, my God, not the poor, not the people who are barely surviving, my God shall supply all your needs. All your needs. According to his riches in glory by Christ Jesus. So, Gehazi went after Naaman and said, uh, you know, the master sent me uh, these uh, servants of prophets who tell lies. And these followers of prophets who tell lies, the, the master sent me, he just received some guests now. And uh, oh, so how much do you want? And they loaded him, how happy Gehazi was. And then he came back home and left it somewhere. And Elisha said, Gehazi, Gehazi, yes, sir, I'm here. Don't listen to them. Yes, sir, I'm here. They're yeah, not there. And uh, where have you been? Ah, I'm your servant now. And I go anywhere without telling you that servant went no whither. Ah, did not my heart follow you? When you follow that man, pity the leaders that don't have spiritual discernment. Pity the prophets that don't have revelation from heaven. They, they tell you that servant won't know. Nobody did that. Nobody could have done that. Here we are. Here we are. And Elisha said, but I knew, I saw you following the man, I saw you taking this and taking that, I saw you hiding that thing here. You cannot hide anything from a servant of God that has true anointing. You will have anointing. I see some mothers, their daughters get pregnant. They're living in the same house. One month, two months, three months, four months, daddy and mommy will know nothing. And the daughter is already four months pregnant. Five months, six months, seven months, they now start to notice this girl is becoming bigger and puffy. And you see, the mother says, my daughter, anything happening to you? <laughs> Mom, why are you asking me a question like that? Nothing. And the mother said, thank God. Thanking God for a lie. Thanking God for falsehood. Thanking God for motherly blindness. 
Eventually, he smiles. Now he smiles. When the daughter now, now has labor pains. Then the mother rushes you in. My daughter, my daughter, oh, what's happening to you? My stomach, my stomach. What's wrong with your stomach? And while they are asking questions, the lady is put into bed. So you are pregnant. You have the anointing. The anointing we're having. Just shaking and jumping and speaking in tongues. We don't have the anointing that discovers this one is going wrong. God will give us the right anointing. You bring, um, you know, a man in your church. Because this man is, uh, you know, in chemistry, physics, biology, he knows quite a lot. And I want my daughters to know like this, chemistry, biology, physics. And you bring this man. And you are not there. Don't even look at what they are doing. Just teach them distinction. You hear? My daughters must make distinction. Yes, sir. And it's with that, those girls, and it's going to them one by one by one. And before you know, this one gets pregnant. Second daughter gets pregnant. Where did you get this? Uh, he's our teacher. That was sent. The teacher is collecting money to destroy your daughters. And you are a prophet. And you are a pastor. You have no discernment. Zero discernment. Elisha was not like that. I will not be like that. I will not be like that. We're chasing mosquitoes. And a lion is pursuing us. There are little, little problems like mosquitoes. We're busy fighting those little, little problems. And the lion is about to eat us up. A lion is about to eat up the church. Turn around. Deal with this lion. The mosquitoes will take care of themselves. And so we think of this anointing of Elisha. What letter have you got to now? F. Feed a nation in farming with supernatural, superabundant supply, anointing. And there was famine in Israel. And the king was so frustrated that he said, this prophet, this Elisha, I'll take off his head today. And Elisha already knew because he was discussing with elders of the land. And he told those elders, said, did you see the son of the madman running after me wanting to take my head? Uh, you know, uh, when you have anointing, you have eyes on the inside. Insight from the inside. And you know what's really taking place. And so he said, grab him. Don't let him come in, the servant is saying. And then, as he spoke that, he said, now, by this time tomorrow, a barrel, a, she um, a shekel, will be, uh, will be spent to buy this much food. And the Lord, on which the servant, on which uh, the king leaned, said, Ah, even if God will open the windows of heaven, can that be when they challenge the real prophecy of a real prophet? The prophet said, What I said from the Lord will come to pass, but you will see it, but you will not taste of it. It happened. I said it happened. <laughs> Feeding the nation. The nation in famine was fed. As we minister, as preachers, as prophets, and the priests of the Lord, we feed our nation. Yes, with the word. The word that brings faith in their heart, that brings the supply they will have. 
your life, your ministry will not be empty in Jesus' name. Amen. Oh, open the servant's eyes to the supernatural obstruct the stranger's eyes to sell. Open the servant's eyes to the supernatural obstruct the stranger's eyes to sell. Now the king of Syria said, here we are. We plan strategy of war to take this king in Samaria. And before we take this step, he knows her secret. Before we take this step, he knows her secret. Who among you here is here spying for the king in uh, Samaria? Oh, they said, King, nobody here. There is one man over there. His name is Elisha. They will know your name for power. Yeah. Your name for anointing. Yeah. As long as that man is there, you cannot catch the king of Israel. He said, then he said, chariots, men with horses, go get him. Only one man. And so they woke up in the morning and the servant first of all saw them. They surrounded the place where Elisha was. He said, oh, my master, what shall we do? Oh, he said, don't worry about them. They that be with us are more than they that be with them. Amen. Amen. And then he said, Lord, open his eyes that he may see. And the Lord opened the eyes of the servant and he saw chariots of fire. Where did they come from? The chariot that took Elijah away came on standby for Elisha. Amen. The chariot that took his master away came now standing to do whatever they have to do to preserve the ministry of Elisha. So the eyes of the servants were opened, no more fear. And then those people came. And Elisha did not panic. He stayed there. And these messengers of destruction, they came. They're looking for, who are they looking for? Elisha said, obstruct their view. That they will stand in my front. They will not recognize me. He opened the eyes of the servant. He obstructed the eyes of of these strangers and they were asking Elisha and he said we're looking for oh he said I know who you really want I'm just in between you and the man I'll take you to the man you're looking for already he obstructed their sight for not to see him recognize him and he took them to the king of Samaria and uh, Elisha said, good morning, sir, <laughs> your majesty. Look at these people. Ah, these are our enemies. Shall I kill them? Why will you kill them? Don't kill them. Let them see. They've been on a long journey searching for us. Give them food. And then the, uh, Elisha said, Lord, open their eyes that they will see. They are now right in the midst of the enemy camp. And the Lord opened their eyes and they saw. Don't worry, we'll not kill you. We don't have any bloodthirsty passion within us. After they have eaten, he sent them back to their master. They never came again. Amen. They will not come again. Amen. That is the anointing we're talking about. That opens the eyes to see and obstruct the others. Our is to restore the dead back to life. Back to life and strength and soundness. That's Elisha. Eventually, Elisha died. And he buried him. It was in an open grave. And as he dropped this dead man, that man came back to life. 
You didn't say amen to that one. He died, but the bulls still retained the power. And I'm thinking, if the bulls of dead Elisha can raise up that dead fellow, I vouch the body, the hand of a living, anointed prophet today. It will do it. I said, it will do it. You know, sometimes people don't understand anointing. They might, you know, when they are strong and healthy and jumping and running, and they say, in Jesus' name, and then they, you know, put their hands and all that. Now, I was in a particular crusade. And uh, because we're moving from place to place, I, they're giving me something over there. Before I got to this uh, particular crusade, I didn't go well with my system. And I was, you know, the stomach was running here, running there, almost running away from me. And um, so uh, we were there on the crusade field and where they had sung choruses, they had sung a congressional song and all that. And uh, the choir was about to come. And that stomach hit me again. And I told the fellow by my side, one of our good ushers there, I said, I need to visit the restroom right now, right now, hurry. And then we ran there. And I didn't even know whether the you know, restroom was good or not. I wasn't looking for, you know, state of the earth restroom. I was just looking for a place to pour out whatever is, you know, running over there. And, and the choir, I could hear them from the microphone. They were already singing. Today, day of power. Today, day of authority. Today, day of healing. So, I finished very well. So that the thing will not grab me again when I go over there. And so, after coming out of there... Nobody knew I went anywhere. Nobody knew stomach was running. Don't tell them. They are not your doctors. If he is not a doctor, don't tell him. If she is not a nurse, a doctor, don't tell her. What is he going to do with the information she cannot handle? And so I didn't tell anybody, even our state overseer just knew that, I mean over there, not here, just knew that I ran somewhere to go and do something uh, uh, secret and private to me. <laughs> and then when I finished, I came back. And now the choir, I still made the choir, and then the choir filed out. And the person to introduce me said, you know, here we have a father in the Lord, an evangelist and a pastor. And today, he leads into the word of God, you will be saved. And the people said, yeah. and then if you are sick, whatever. Problem you have, your healing has come. Yeah. Did I say inside me that <laughs> not today? <laughs> because I myself, I am down. How can a man that is down pick up another man that was down? No, I wasn't down. My stomach had signal that something went wrong and entered, just signal. But my spirit did not have stomach problem. The anointing did not have a stomach challenge. The power that raised Christ from the dead did not have any doubt. So, all the introduction, I said yes to the introduction. Yeah. And then I came here in the name of the Lord, not in my name. And once I got there, I forgot stomach. Yeah. You'll forget stomach. Yeah. And I preached the word and gave the altar call 
and see people responding to the altar call and then after that i said now let, let's pray we're going to pray for the sick whatever your challenge you are going to be healed today and then we prayed not praying from the stomach praying from the heart not praying from the problem praying on the basis of the promises and I want to tell you, I could name the, I could name the city, the people will remember, you know, that time. And the blind began to see. And the lame began to walk. And great, great things happened. The same thing will happen to you. We don't look at the things around us. We look at the thing inside us and because of that we're able in the strength of the lord and the might of the lord we're able to do what the lord has called us to do yeah. give me yeah. she was tea the they, i'm talking about the anointing, what the anointing does in your ministry was T. Was R. Was A. Was N. Was S. Was F. Was O. Was R M maintain the anointing and the spirit saturation to the end. Maintain, maintain the anointing that Elisha had. From that day, Elijah was taken away. He maintained that anointing. He got it in chapter 2. Look at chapter 3, you see the anointing. Look at chapter 4, you see the anointing. Look at chapter 5, you see the anointing still operating. Look at chapter 6, you see the anointing still operating. Look at chapter 7, you see the anointing still operating. And look at the very end of his life in chapter 13. The anointing was maintained to the very end and the spirit supernatural walking in him walking on him walking through him was maintained to the very end that's the kind of anointing we come to get today that he puts upon our heart he puts upon our ministry and what he has called us for to reform and to transform the nation in which we live and to transform every community he sends us to will maintain that anointing from now to the very end in Jesus' name. Amen. Another amen. amen. An amen of confirmation. Amen. Rise up now, rise up now and let us pray. And you tell the Lord, Lord, here I am. Here I am. The anointing that transforms, the anointing that remains, the anointing that abides until the very end. That in your life, your ministry, he gives you that anointing that abides, that does the work it was sent to do in your life. Anointing. Did you notice the conversion of the man? From following the oxen, toiling on the physical field, to now serving the Lord in spiritual power. Did 
Did you see the call, the calling of the man? How he led everything to pursue his calling. Are you a man of one calling? A man of one pursuit, a woman of one passion, have you noticed this preparation for that anointing from the moment we started following Elisha, Elijah, never, never, never turn back. Rainy season, dry season, challenging times, discouraging times, never, never turn back. Following wholeheartedly the Lord blesses the people that follow him without looking back. Following him without yielding to temptation. Without giving up in a time of discouragement, following through the valley, through the mountain, through the plain, following him. Not selling. The anointing for the money with Naaman from Syria. Anointing not for sale. Conviction not for sale. The standard not for sale. Follow him. And follow him till the time of the rapture of Elijah. And even when he knew that Elijah was going away, the thought of being alone, you know, shaking. I've decided to follow Jesus, to turn him back, to turn him back. Friends, may forsake me. No turning back. No turning back. Persecution. Misrepresentation. Falsehood. Lies. Hatred and lining of your character become follow Christ, no turning back, 
no turning back. Elijah was the master of Elisha. Christ is your own master. Follow him. Christ, your own master. Follow him. Trials come, temptations come, follow him. Persecution comes, follow him. Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that believeth on me, the works I do, he shall also do. And greater works than these shall he do. Because I go unto my Father. Follow him. And let the anointing work in your life. Let it work in a descriptive manner. Let it work. It will work. It must work. Go where he has sent you. The anointing will do what the Lord has sent you to do in your life. In Jesus' name we pray. Yeah. You've got it. Yeah. It will manifest. Yeah. Father, we well, thank you. Your promises are yes and amen. Yeah. No word of your promise will fail to anyone in the ministry here. Amen. And I pray, Lord, you open the windows of heaven Amen. and shower down real heaven sent anointing to every brother, every sister, every man, every woman here in Jesus' name. Amen. Lord, clear anointing. Transforming anointing. Yeah. Heavenly anointing. Yeah. Supernatural anointing. Yeah. Let it come now, now, at this time. In Jesus' name. Yeah. It's not by feeling, by faith. Not by trying. By trust. We we'll trust you. Yeah. It has come. Yeah. Brother, it has come on you. Yeah. Sister, it has come on you. Yeah. 
And as we go out of this place, and the ministry you carry out from this very morning, the ministry you carry out will be done with this new anointing. Yeah. You will do what you have never done. Yeah. You proclaim what you have never proclaimed. Yeah. You will decree what you have never decreed. Yeah. And you will touch lives you have never touched. Yeah. Your own life, your own family, yeah. your own children, yeah. your converts, yeah. members of the church ministry you minister in, they will know, they will sense, they will feel this new anointing in your life in Jesus name the Lord has spoken to you that makes sense every other thing contrary that any voice will minister to you I render that nonsense you will stand you will walk. Amen. You will run. Amen. You will preach. Amen. You will pray. Amen. You will have converts. Amen. You will see miracles. Amen. You see the world around you turn around for the better. Amen. Go in the strength of the Lord. Amen. And prove the anointing true. Come back with testimonies. Thank you, Lord. We know it is done. In Jesus' name, we pray.